caught on a police body camera, an Aurora officer uses a horribly racist yes. slur. And, uh, we got the Alabama porch monkeys all contained. <laughs> The police chief fires him, but tonight that officer is back on the job. It appears at some point in there the officer may have lost his footing and in doing so fired one shot. Right. Oh. This man, Darshawn Kelly, was tased by Aurora police for no reason. Originally, he was arrested and charged with failing to obey lawful order, but then those charges were dropped and the officer was never disciplined. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Get your arm out here. Okay, I will. Stop. Stop. Unfairly thrown to the ground and choked. That's what one woman says three Aurora police officers did to her. The task force could soon be looking into whether an Aurora police officer got special treatment when he was found passed out drunk behind the wheel of an unmarked police car. And that officer was not even investigated for DUI, and he kept his job. And we learned today that there are three Aurora police officers that are on paid administrative leave during this investigation. The fire department, meanwhile, says it believes it followed protocol properly. A new autopsy report is shedding some light on the death of a man police say they were trying to restrain. Denver 7's Lance Hernandez has that report, and Lance, still a lot of questions. That report says Elijah McLean's death could have been accidental, natural, or homicide. A pathologist couldn't make a determination. I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. No, I am an introvert. I'm going home. Relax or I'm going to have to change this situation. And I will stop my music to listen. I'm going to have Elijah McLean. We have uh, we had East Carotta. That's what I was doing. I was just going home. Welcome to American Wounds. This is the story of Aurora Police and the killing of Elijah McClain. I'm your host, Nate Grapes. Imagine you're driving down the street on a hot August night at 10.30 p.m. You see what looks to be a slim, rather small young white male, somewhere between 19 and 23, walking down the street. Despite the 80 degree evening, this young white male is wearing pants and a jacket with a jogging mask covering his mouth and nose. As he walks down the street, he waves his arms erratically. In that moment, what do you do? Do you approach that young white male? Do you call out to him? Do you ask him if he's doing okay? If he needs assistance? Do you follow him for a while to see if the young white male's unusual behavior continues? Or instead, do you pick up your phone and call the police, telling the 911 operator that a young white male is swinging his arms erratically on the street wearing a ski mask? Elijah McClain wasn't a young white male. He was a young black male. Walking home on a hot August night after grabbing some iced teas for himself and some friends at the local gas station. For Elijah, the 23-year-old massage therapist who was both anemic and an avid runner wearing a jacket and running mask had become routine. He'd been wearing the mask as he purchased his drinks and despite being in a place of business, he wasn't asked to remove it. In fact, security camera footage would later reveal that Elijah had been joking around with some customers in the line as he paid for his items. Before leaving the store, Elijah turned around and bowed to the last people he would ever have the chance of conversing with. Elijah Jovan McLean was a Denver native who lived close to his family in Aurora, Colorado. His mother, Shanine McLean, had roots in Park Hill on Denver's northeast side, but had long ago moved to get Elijah and her five other children away from potential gang violence. In a 2019 article written by Grant Stringer for the Sentinel, Colorado, Shanine would say, quote, I just didn't want my kids to be caught up in that life. I thought if I got away from the gang life, Aurora would be safer for my kids. Boy, was I wrong. In the same Sentinel piece, the mother describes her son as an independent intellectual, someone who needs to expand his brain on his own terms, at his own pace. She would say of Elijah, quote, I believe that he was in search of higher knowledge at the time. Elijah took his independence seriously, excelling during a stint of homeschooling and going on to earn a GED from Emily Griffith Technical College in Denver. By his teens, he taught himself to draw and play the guitar and violin. By young adulthood, Elijah was a total free thinker with a mind all his own. He became a vegetarian, calling out his carnivorous friends and family for their cannibalistic ways, preferring instead the food that comes from, quote, the fields and the trees. By 19, Elijah would begin a career in massage, excelling quickly at both the technique itself and as well as the social and spiritual aspects that accompany it. Former clients remember Elijah for his deep conversations and healing energy. 
April Young, a former manager at Massage Envy in Inglewood, Colorado, supervised Elijah before becoming close friends. She tell the Sentinel that Elijah had, quote, a childlike spirit and was not conditioned to the norms of America. He lived in his own little world. He was never into fitting in. He just was who he was. Happy Surprise! Birthday. <laughs> Hope you late birthday. <laughs> Happy super late birthday. Nice. <laughs> Wait, really? This sentiment was echoed all across Elijah's community. Colleagues would often hear him snapping and humming to himself while walking down the hall. On lunch breaks while others ate, Elijah could be found in the back playing his violin or jamming on the guitar. Elijah's close friend Eric Barons would tell the Sentinel about Elijah saying, quote, if you didn't know him and happened to see him out on the sidewalk killing time doing something like that, you would have been confused. But he was always a little bit like that. Elijah, who never owned a car, became an avid runner, tearing through the city miles at a time, using his legs as transportation. This was when the running mask came into play, something his loved ones think protected him from the cold and from his social anxieties. The prior resulted from Elijah's anemia, a condition due to a lack of red blood cells. However, Marna Arnett, another former client and close friend of Elijah, spoke to the Sentinel about the mask, saying, quote, he would hide behind the mask. It was protection for him, too. It made him more comfortable being in the outside world. On Saturday, August 24th, 2019, the Aurora Police Department Dispatch Center received a 911 call at 10.32 p.m. from a man named Juan. Bang on one, what is the address of the emergency? So there's a, so there's a guy, he has a, he's walking, let's see, the opposite, what's the opposite of north? At, south. South, yeah, he's walking south on Billing Street, he has a mask on. Okay. And then, and then when I pass by him, he puts, he puts his hands up and does all these kinds of signs. I don't know, he, he looks good to you, I don't, he might be... Okay. Yeah. Before the dispatcher ends the call, she asks Juan if he or anyone else is in danger, to which Juan replies, quote, no. Okay, don't approach him, okay? If you need to, just drive away. I don't want you to go near him. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? No. Okay, I already have a call in, okay? I need to get his full description. What race is he? I think he's a, a black male. Okay. Um, how old does he look? I know he's wearing a mask. I have no clue. The Aurora Police Department quickly dispatched Officer Nathan Woodyard, the first officer to arrive on the scene. Officer Woodyard is almost immediately joined by Officer Jason Rosenblatt, followed seconds later by Officer Randy Rodema. Your favorite stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. Well, okay. Turn around. No, Turn around. Actually, Turn around. Stop. Stop tensing up, dude. Stop tensing up, bro. Stop tensing up. Stop tensing up. Stop tensing up. No, let go of me. No, I am an introvert. Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. Stop tensing up. Stop. Relax. I'm going home. Relax or I'm going to have to change this situation. Stop. Leave me alone. Sir, can you please... No, we I want to tell you, right? leave me alone. No, we're gonna, First we're gonna off, talk you guys you. started to arrest me, and I was stopping my music to listen. Now let go of me. Let's get over to grass. Okay. We're gonna lay you down. The footage you've just watched is not only disturbing, but also extremely disorienting. Only one of the three body cameras produces any useful footage. Still 
edge of the plane. We have a uh, to use karate. That's what I was doing. It was just going home. Oh. 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 I made you very and I'm different. He come out? He's out? Uh, he, was he out? Uh, he, I heard some no. snoring. I just he didn't, he wasn't right. completely. He, oh, didn't, yeah. he didn't lose oh. consciousness. Yeah. I'm just different. He tried I'm to just come out. He tried to come out. Ow. Okay, okay. Stop, dude. Well, chill out. You've already been told several times to stop. I can't breathe correctly because... Uh. Move your camera, dude. Hey, dude, relax. I think he's trying to pee. Oh, okay. Get it out, dude. Thanks, bro. Get it out. Despite being handcuffed and fully subdued, lying in fetal position with at least eight men and women from Aurora Police and Fire surrounding him, the three officers and fire medic Jeremy Cooper determined it necessary to hit Elijah with a syringe carrying 500 milligrams of ketamine. And we'll give that a couple of minutes and we'll see if that works. Much your bro. Yeah. We'll go to the bed. He's keep raising his legs. <laughs> Within minutes, the report claims Elijah, quote, calmed down and he was then placed on a gurney and loaded into the ambulance. According to the official letter by Colorado State 17th District Attorney Dave Young, quote, Fire medic Jeremy Cooper noted that after his initial examination, Mr. McLean's chest was not rising on his own and he did not have a pulse. Resuscitation and medication were allegedly administered to Elijah in the ambulance before being taken to the University of Colorado Hospital for treatment. Despite the advanced medical care carried out by hospital staff, Elijah was declared brain dead on August 27, 2019 at 3.51 p.m., less than three days after his encounter with the Aurora police officers. A forensic autopsy performed by Dr. Steven Cena was declared undetermined. Instead, the doctor offered several alternative possibilities that could have led to Elijah's death, concluding, quote, a combination of intense physical exertion and a narrow left coronary artery contributed to Mr. McLean's death. While on the scene, Mr. McLean displayed unusual behavior and enhanced strength. These features are commonly seen in excited delirium. It is thought that when adrenaline levels drop, potassium levels surge, resulting in the arrhythmia. This mechanism may well explain his cardiac arrest, which led to anoxic encephalopathy, end quote. The following day, Sheena McLean received the call every parent fears most. She would meet an Aurora police representative at the University of Colorado Hospital where she would find out that her son was now on life support following an altercation with police officers the night before. The three officers, Officer Nathan Woodyard, Jason Rosenblatt, and Randy Rodema were placed on administrative leave for the week following their search and seizure of Elijah McClain. The next two weeks they were shifted to limited duty where they would go on to resume their normal patrol in Northeast Aurora. Elijah's mother, Shanine, and his family and friends were left to make sense of the unimaginable. Elijah's case was quickly taken on by lawyer Mari Newman, who believes that Elijah was, quote, tortured by these officers for a significant period of time, and there are injuries all over his body to prove it. It would take over two months for D.A. Dave Young to release the findings of Elijah's case, where he'd ultimately rule Elijah's death a non-homicide and hold none of the three officers accountable in any way. Mari Newman would quickly respond to the DA's findings, which were conspicuously handed out late on a Friday evening before Thanksgiving week by saying, quote, If Aurora thinks this is appropriate policing, the community should be petrified. We are disappointed, but not surprised that once again, members of law enforcement will not be held criminally accountable for killing an unarmed black man. The city of Aurora is predominantly Caucasian, with the whites making up 56.5% of the population. Although African Americans only make up 10.2% of the population, they are twice as likely to be subjected to traffic stops than their white counterparts. Once a routine stop has been made, African American persons and vehicles are searched at a significantly higher rate. To this, Newman states the following, quote, 
the DA's letter relies on an erroneous legal standard to try to create a false impression that there was legal justification to stop and frisk Elijah in the first place. The DA analyzes the officer's conduct using a reasonable suspicion standard, even though the 911 caller was clear he was not reporting criminal activity. Elijah had no weapon and no one was in danger. Police had no responsible suspicion that Elijah had committed any crime, so there was no legal justification to either stop or search him. Newman demands, quote, neither Officer Woodyard nor any other APD officer ever advised Mr. McLean that they wanted to search him. Officer Woodyard simply started applying force from the second that he was physically close enough to do so. No APD officer had a legal basis to put their hands on Mr. McLean. As Officer Jason Rosenblatt approaches Elijah from the rear, we hear Officer Nathan commanding Elijah to, quote, stop tensing up, stop tensing up. At the same moment, Officer Jason threatens Elijah, saying this isn't going to go well. In an investigation following the incident, Officer Jason Rosenblatt told the detective, quote, I was trying to be calm. Some people tense up when we first grabbed him and were taught that. Officer Jason Rosenblatt was one of six officers from the Aurora Police Department to be named in a civil rights claim filed with the U.S. District Court of Colorado in 2019. In the claim, a Denver man states he was pulled over and searched without cause or reason on multiple occasions. He's filed six claims against the officers and named Rosenblatt as the lead aggressor. The claims are as follows. Unlawful search and seizure, denial of equal protection, negligence, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and two claims of false arrest and false imprisonment. The claim is still open. On the night of August 24th, despite forcefully taking control of Elijah's arm from the front and back, still neither officer makes any statement of why they are stopping Elijah. At this point, Officer Randy is just watching the two other officers as they attempt to seize Elijah. However, suddenly Officer Randy's camera begins to shake and he yells out, he just tried to grab your gun, dude. At that moment, Elijah is seized by all three officers who violently drop him to the ground, pummeling his face into the rocks. Officer Randy Rodema told investigators, quote, I see the individual in the ski mask grab Officer Rosenblatt's gun. I immediately grabbed the individual by his head with both hands and pulled him down to the ground so that he was bent over. He fell to the ground. He was still fighting us, swinging his arms pretty hard. It was at this point that Officer Jason attempted for several seconds to put Elijah in a carotid hold, the same hold that is being outlawed in police departments across the country for the danger it presents. We must note that in our research for this episode, most of, if not all, personal information on the three officers, Nathan Woodyard, Jason Rosenblatt, and Randy Rodema, has been scrubbed clean from the internet. However, we were able to find the most information on Officer Randy Rodema. This is what we know. Randy is a 37-year-old Colorado native who's married with young children. He's a registered Republican and lists his views online as Christian. Randy is a U.S. Marine veteran and was severely wounded in a gun battle while on patrol in Iraq. He survived multiple gunshots thanks to another Marine who was awarded the Silver Star for his heroics. We cannot be sure how this violent near-death experience in Iraq affected Randy's mental state. What makes the following moments of Elijah's encounter with Aurora police even harder to piece together is that only Officer Randy's body cam was in position during their takedown of Elijah, and within seconds following the takedown, all three of the officer's body cameras would become detached from their persons. Newman responds to this fact in her letter to the city, stating, quote, That's something missing from the DA's letter. The fact that all three of the hands-on officers were able to shed their body cameras. And we know it's not an accident. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, Elijah lays on the ground in restraints while surrounded by Aurora police and fire. Nobody offers him support of any kind. Nobody explains what just happened or why the officers approached Elijah in the first place. As Elijah pleads with anyone who will listen, he's repeatedly told to, quote, stop messing around. One officer questions what drugs he's on. Another officer who came to the scene looks down casually at Elijah and threatens him with a dog. If you keep messing around, I'm going to bring my dog out. He's going to dog bite you. You understand me? Keep messing around. I think we're okay for here. I appreciate it. Thanks. Watch your step, dude. Your brain is puke. Aurora's chief of police, Nick Metz, characterized it as, quote, unprofessional. That's not unprofessional. That's an overwhelming statement of a sadistic personality. 
of a person who's got so little regard for another human being. That should be a terminable offense. An officer who would say something like that shouldn't be in a position to serve and protect anyone. End quote. And then finally, before any other attempts to calm Elijah through words, oxygen, or even water are made, Aurora police and fire determine that it's necessary to inject Elijah with 500 milligrams of ketamine. According to an article by the Sentinel Colorado, Aurora firefighters began carrying ketamine in January 2019. Family and friends remain in disbelief of the events that transpired that fateful night. Elijah's friend Eric Barron said to the Sentinel, quote, If you were to pull Elijah over and talk to him, he's never been in trouble with the police. He is not confrontational. He is very cooperative. If anything, he would be like, I'm so sorry to distract you from your night. It's confusing. Of course, Elijah's mother, Shanine McLean, is more confused than anyone. She told CBS Denver, quote, it was difficult. It was very hard to see how everybody reacted inhumane. It was like there was no real compassion or concern. The only explanation that Shanine received came from her own lawyer. Newman told Westworld, quote, existing while black seems to be a crime in Aurora, but apparently existing while black and acting a little differently than everybody else has somehow become a capital offense. Family and friends will remember Elijah most for his spirit. Shanine told the Sentinel, quote, Eli was all about tolerance and acceptance, advancing himself and helping others do that. He was always trying to evolve. He wanted to change the world. And it's crazy because he ended up doing it anyway. As the nation reels from the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, Elijah's case has been brought back to the forefront of public discourse. On June 10, 2020, the Sentinel Colorado reported that Aurora lawmakers had demanded a new death query for Elijah McClain, asking for a, quote, neutral third party to examine the events of August 24th. As things move forward with the query and other updates that should arise within the case, we will create a part two video to bring you up to speed. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Our commitment is to bring you behind the headlines to promote discourse and accountability. We hope you enjoyed. This is American Wounds. I'm Nate Grapes.